All right. Welcome to Romance Happy Hour. Thanks for joining us on a, at least here in Minnesota, muggy summer. Um, grateful for air conditioning tonight. I don't know about you guys, but it's it's kind of it's kind of warm out here right now. So, well, I was um, just actually thinking that because literally I did notice that every single one of us is wearing a tank top. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, I'm in a sundress. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been warm. It's been warm. So I'm here with my co-host John Ludicky and guest Melanie Johnson, Melanie Dev. We're super excited to hear from you, ladies. So to get into that, Dawn, what has been up with you? You were on the verge, cusp of moving crime. Yes, I am. Um, so I did, I finished, I managed to finish Cowboys and Christmas Trees today, and I'm like super, super proud of myself for that. Um, I did it while, you know, we had an emergency stop with our car in the shop and all this crap, but I had my laptop. So I got it done and now I'm just going to be doing some edits, but mostly I'm going to be moving cross country here in the next couple weeks. So yeah, super excited about that. I'm going to kind of take a break and then I'll see you everybody on the second Thursday. And that's about when I'm going to be kicking things into high gear for my writing stuff again. But yeah. That's we hope you have by the end of August. Yes. Yeah. I will be settled in a new house, you know, our brand new house with, you know, my kids at school. That'll be exciting for me. <laughs> yeah. What about you, Dylan? What have you been working on? You, I saw you've been on the road and crazy busy and yeah, I just with your cowboy, with cowboy charming. Yes. I just got to hang out with Melanie weekend at Riders on the River. Yeah. Lovely Peoria, Illinois. Um, we we uh, little cocktails and and had some fun. So we did. Dylan had a whole mini bar that she brought with her. I was very impressed. <laughs> sure, she did. <laughs> I had a blood. You had like a blood orange vodka that was very good. <laughs> Ooh. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I typically my own beverages, so just just yeah, in case, you no. Know. <laughs> Karen is already saying no questions tonight. Karen, you're gonna let us down, man. Yeah. <laughs> Karen tried Dylan that was last talking night. Night. Well, I mean, I mean, she is driving home, so Karen, if you if fair you enough, get home first, <laughs> pop us some questions, but don't get in a wreck. Just <laughs> yeah. answer the questions. Exactly. Um, so. We also have Teresa and Catherine and Linda. Um, I'm pretty sure we'll have more than enough yeah. questions. So. <laughs> yeah, and I can't answer them in the chat because for some reason I cannot access, like I don't have a place to type for the chat, so. Okay. Well, yeah, I think the chat, but you can't reply, is that? Nothing. I'm, I'm, doing, it, like, I'm, so I'm doing it on my phone. Oh. Are you doing it on Facebook? Yeah. Uh, well, yes. the, well, we can always just um, answer live, and then if you ever, if you want to later, you can go back and answer any yeah, specific of questions. Yep. Yeah, probably best since you know I plan to drink this whole thing. Okay. <laughs> what are you drinking? It is a um, Moscow Mule, so it's ginger beer mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. lime vodka and fresh limes. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Oh, just. <laughs> You're oh, almost done. <laughs> you need a refill. <laughs> can I can I show a secret that I have that I don't that you guys don't know? So I, I have my drink. Okay, <laughs> I have my drink. No, I actually have a second one, so you can't <laughs> tell. <laughs> two fisting it. Two fisting it at a home. So, so it, the first one is empty, and then we see another glass pop up with and they're identical, so we never know. Never know. Yep. I love it so much. I've been doing so it for years. <laughs> so fun. Yeah, so Teresa, if you like Moscow and you, um, this is made with it's a Bundaberg or Brundaberg, I'm not sure. It's an Australian ginger beer, and I use the the diet one, which is like only 10 calories, so it makes my Moscow Mule be very um, healthy, be a non guilty pleasure. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, Sonali says healthy. I, I think healthy is a yes, good way healthy. to. Yes, healthy. It's fresh lime juice, and ginger is good for you. So mm -hmm. yeah. 
Right. I'm getting that recipe because my husband is totally into vodka lately. So I'm going to do it. <laughs> All right. Melody and Sonali, why don't you introduce yourselves and tell us, you've been here before, but um, tell us a little bit about tonight. And if you want to share where you're coming to us from, that would be great. And give us a, a little high, high level intro of, of who we are and what you write. Uh, okay, so <laughs> I'm Melanie Johnson, and Sonali and I actually both live in like the suburbs of Chicago. I'm more on the north side. She's a little bit more west um, of me. But yeah, so I am the author of a couple of different contemporary romances. My Sometimes in Love series came out in 2019. I had a um, kind of wild entry into publishing. I had three books released back to back to back. Um, April, May, June of 2019, and that was the Sometimes in Love series. And then my uh, new rom-com just came out July 6th. Sonali and I also share a release date, so both our books dropped on July 6th. And so it's too good to be real. And this is brand new. Um, it's like it's a standalone book. There is a follow-up book coming next fall, um, but it is it is a love letter to rom-coms. It is a cornucopia of rom-com references. It is my pandemic escape hatch. I wrote this um, really just as a way to have fun and to be silly. If you notice, there's a seagull with um, a bikini in his beak that happens in the book. <laughs> it's just it's just all kinds of silliness, and I it's very fluffy. And if you look wanting something to just, it's a true, a true beach read, a true summer escapist light read. So that's, um, having lots of fun with that. So yeah, and I also uh, was with Dylan on the Jingle Balls um, holiday anthology. So if you read that, you you might have gotten a, a taste of of my writing in there. And I'm excited about our, our upcoming anthology, um, Tinsel and Tatas, which yeah. will be out um, this fall. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, I, I think we excited. have a cover reveal coming up for that next in month. August, so. I know it's wild. Like it feels like it's coming. Like so, they like, always like rolls into things so fast, and I'm so excited. I am going to tease this a little bit. I have another anthology I am in coming up in um, February, and it's in a seasoned romance box. And seasoned means couples uh, characters over forty. <laughs> which I guess that makes a season, which cracks me up. <laughs> um, but I'm really looking forward to this because I'm just planning to have lots of fun. And it, the title of the novella is That's What She Shed. And it is about a divorcee who um, decides to renovate her husband's man cave into a room of her own, a she shed. And um, the very hot silver fox contractor um, is very good with his tools. <laughs> so <laughs> we will have that. That is super cute. Oh my it's gosh, so I love fun. that so much. Yeah, she, it's, um, it's men remarry, women remodel. <laughs> it's kind yeah. of like, <laughs> I like that tagline. And you know, that's kind of, um, as I think about friends, it's kind of true. Yes, that's the thing. It's like kind of where the idea came from a little bit, you know, and also just like she's shedding her inhibition. She shed her yep. old life. You know, it's also playing on the word shed and just just having a good time. Just, just it's I going to it. be I said I'm leaning very hard into the euphemisms, drilling, hammering, pounding, nailing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I, I have a my, my first indie book was a sexy contractor and it's they are plentiful and <laughs> lots easy. of opportunities to have fun low with those. Fruit. Yep, it's some low hanging <laughs> fruit, but yeah, it's always fun. yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yes, I'm I'm all about it. <laughs> I love I'm it. just excited to write characters that are like my age. You know, I've right. um I've written a, quite a few millennials, so I'm ready mm -hmm. to 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 come back to the Gen Xers. <laughs> you know, I, I, I sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> how about you? Sonali? How about you? Oh, me. All right. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, am I, yeah. Now those are some of the cleverest um, titles, Melanie. Like mm -hmm. all of them, including tinsels and tatas. Like who comes up with? Yeah, them? I can't claim the tinsel and tatas. That's that was a group effort. <laughs> mm -hmm. And jingle balls. I mean, how mm -hmm. has that not been taken? I love I, this so much. It had been taken, but um, you know, it's we we ran with it. 
<laughs> it worked. Yeah, it worked. Another, I mean, it was, you know, it was a she to benefit testicular cancer awareness. And so, I mean, how I don't know how we could have not been jingle balls. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I, yes, I, when she told me, I was like, wow, that is good. And, and now you're just, you know, on and on and on and more. What is the next book in this? Do you have a title for the next book in your um, wrong in this For this one, um, the other, the next book is Too Wrong to Be Right, but that could yeah. change. It I could love change. that title yeah. too. That is just so. It really fits the book really well because the heroine is someone who is always drawn to the wrong guys. Yeah. So yeah, she kind of makes a checklist of finding her Mr. Right, who obviously is not the right one <laughs> because it. <laughs> well, we were talking about this before because it takes a little bit of while you were sleeping and plays with those tropes. Yeah. So. My, my right, favorite. Now you to tell us about you and your books. <laughs> my favorite rom com of all time is while you were yes. sleeping. Yeah. All right, so I am Sonali Dev, and I am currently writing um, homages to my four favorite Jane Austen novels, um, and the one that came out with, um, and I have no depth perception, but the one that came out with um, Melanie's on July 6th is in Sense and Sensibility. But essentially, this was a lifelong dream. Um, of um, Jane Austen had a huge impact on me growing up. So they're not retellings in the sense of scene by scene, character by character, but more homages to what I learned from her as a person, as an author, uh, because I do kind of think um, I, I am who I am. And a lot of that trajectory had to do with what I read young, like I think is true for a lot of us, is um, you know the impact of books and these four novels, which are pride, uh, Pride and Prejudice, Persuasion, Sense and Sensibility, and Emma had formative um, impact on me. And <laughs> for those who live with me, that may or may not be a good thing. But, <laughs> but um, so I always wanted to do this. And so these books are set in um, a politically ambitious Indian American family in the Bay Area. And uh, they kick off when their oldest son, and they're descended from Indian royalty. So it's uh, it's a lot of exploration of home, um, you know, of making home in a new place. And my books are always huge family sagas with families who have no idea what boundaries mean, um, you know, and <laughs> and the like. But this is uh, this series kicks off when their oldest son um, announces his run for California governor. And the last book will end on the election. So this is book three, and it is Yash Rajay's story. And he is the man running for California governor. And uh, he's at one of his rallies. And this is a man who has never questioned his path, who's always known exactly what he's going to do, always 100% uh, percent on top of everything, very put together. And uh, he's at a rally. And there's a, a hate crime. There's an assassination attempt. And his uh, bodyguard gets, who is also a friend, gets critically injured. Totally throws him off his game. He no longer has any idea what he was thinking, doing all of this. Starts having massive panic attacks, can't campaign anymore, is three months away from um, the election. And he has this, you know, the world's dreams on his shoulders and he can't do it anymore. And so the only way the family thinks um, they, can get past this without it becoming a huge media scandal, which would sink the campaign, is uh, to have him see his sister's best friend, who is a stress management coach and a yoga guru. And of course, someone he had one magical um, interaction with at his sister's wedding 10 years ago. And so this is the first time, um, you know, he's seeing her again. He ghosted her <laughs> for 10 years and she's the only one who can help him now. And of course, because this is Sense and Sensibility, those of you who are Jane Austen um, fans here will know that he's Edward Ferris. As I, uh, this is also my attempt at writing Edward Ferris with balls. Mm. <laughs> 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 with with Austin, you know, is, is Austin's weakest hero for reasons at the time he wasn't, but he doesn't translate well. And um, and yeah, essentially, um, he is in he's been in a relationship for all to see uh, for ten years. So it's a little bit of the fake engagement spun on its head. And, yeah, yeah. 
Can I just say though that I love this concept so much that while you were talking, I um, ordered Persuasion on Audible um, because that is my favorite Jane Austen book ever. Like I'm a crazy ass Persuasion fan. Um, so my question to you before this, yes, recipe for persuasion. I totally, I, I got it on Audible while you were talking about it. Thank you. I wasn't being rude, I promise. I was ordering yeah. your book. No, no, no. What is your favorite Jane Austen book? Okay, so nobody ever asks me that question, Don. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure. If I had a penny, uh, for every time I've been, um, that's like asking me which of my children is my favorite. Yeah. And the honest answer is, uh, I both I love them both equally, and I love different things about them, and I think which is exactly that. Of these four, I couldn't tell you. There's different things I love about. Um, each one of them. I, I do believe that Pride and Prejudice is the most um, is the most whole, is the most mm -hmm. complete, um, you know, of all of them. All angles of it um, have, uh, you know, are, are genius to me at least, because it is plot-wise, character-wise, the most fully developed and the most uh, expansive. Yeah. That persuasion is the most romantic thing ever. Just that letter, just the yeah. letter he writes to her, just there. So it's the most romantic. Um, I think um, Emma is, um, you know, is, is the most um, is is the most. What is the word I'm looking for? Sharp. The the humor and the social commentary. Witty. Yeah. Um, and all of you know, all of these are social commentary, and I think my books. That's the part that I'm trying. To, I'm talking about because she wasn't writing historical novels. Yeah, mm -hmm. she was writing contemporary novels. She was making commentary about her time, and I think these books are very much co a commentary on our time. So, yeah. So awesome. I mean, they have sense and sensibility. Has um, I think it, in terms of emotional um, exploration of how we love, right? How personality. Um, translates into our relationships and how we kind of present to the world. So each one of them has um, a certain something. And it's the original sister story, right? Um, yeah. So, yeah. I love it. I'm so excited. I've got like a six day travel coming up. So, and I had like seven audible credits. I'm yeah. super excited. I'm like, this is the first one. <laughs> Uh, let, okay, let me let me ask you, how dirty is it? Like, um, <laughs> should I should I have like earphones in? So here it? is the thing: my first, my Bollywood books have uh, you know explicit um, sex scenes, but um, un well, I shouldn't say unfortunately. The the Austin structure is such that the couples don't get together until the end. Okay. So, so you know, there's structurally, so there's there's high sexual tension, but mm -hmm. they're very clean. Your kids can read them, you know. And so, but the one I'm writing right now, which is Emma, is suddenly, um, they're bunnies, you know, because <laughs> Emma, <laughs> Emma and Knightley are the only one of these couples that are, you know, know each other from both. Yeah. And there's mm -hmm. nothing keeping them. Uh, apart and so there's nothing keeping them apart <laughs> so but it's a it's a gender flip the emma and the pride and prejudice are gender flips where uh -huh. the pride and prejudice she is the mr darcy he is the lizzie bennett and an emma he is the emma and she's the mr knightley so she's 13 years older than him um she's mm -hmm. known known him all his life is almost part of his family so and they're bunnies it's gonna be so good. Love I cannot it. wait. I'm super excited about this, and especially because I I told my kids I'm like we're listening to book on tape all week. <laughs> my kids can listen to these. These are really clean. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yay! Now I'm super excited. <laughs> <laughs> you you might drive across the U.S. twice, right? Just so you can listen. I to all might. The I'll be like, Excuse me. <laughs> Just keep going back and forth. <laughs> 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 Yay. Well, I think 
We decided that Melanie is going to read for us first, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what we decided. <laughs> it was a very diplomatic uh, way we decided, right? <laughs> yeah, Sonali decided. That's fine. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it's all good. Um, so yeah, so um, you know, with rom coms, one of the quintessential pieces of romantic comedies is the meet cute. And I love meet cutes. I, and I love meet cute so much that I actually have an Instagram series. So if you go to my uh, Writing Lush Instagram, um, you will find all these interviews I've done with authors asking about meet cutes, including their in real life meet cutes with their significant other, Sonali. I did one with her, so you can find out how she met her husband. Um, I just had one last night with Dorinda Jones. So it's just lots of fun, um, lots of fun. And you can find that over on Instagram. So I'm going to read the meet cute from Too Good To Be Real. <laughs> yeah. All right. We will leave you to it and we will come back when you're done. Okay. You're going to go get a drink or something? <laughs> what? I'm going to leave. Okay. I guess it's just me. So here we go. Closing his eyes, Luke imagined his problems as a row of dominoes. If he lined them all up, he could control how they fell, one after another in a tidy procession. Click, click, click. Eyes still closed, he kept walking. Over the past year, he'd been up and down this path hundreds of times. It was his favorite place on the whole resort. He could walk it blindfolded, backward, in his sleep. He inhaled the fresh lake breeze, a little calmer now. The dominoes tumbled more slowly. Click, click, click. Ouch! A voice, a voice, surprised and feminine, collided with Luke's thoughts as his shin made contact with something hard. What the? Mental domino scattered as Luke stumbled backward. A warm, solid weight falling with him, landing on top of him in the sand. Oof! Had he made that sound? He opened his eyes, his view of the sky above, marred by a tangle of bright hair. Not red, not blonde, not brown either, but some mix of all three. The strangely colored locks blowing across his face smelled rich and inviting, like that first breath of freshly brewed coffee when you step inside a cafe. And it was soft, so silky soft against his cheek. These details skipped across the surface of his thoughts in rapid succession, like pebbles skipping across a lake, leaving ripples in their wake. Just as things began to settle down, an elbow caught him square in the ribs and sent his thoughts flying again. Oof. This time, Luke was sure he'd been the one making that sound. The woman was struggling to get up, and as she tried to stand, she continued to poke and jab him in uncomfortable places. For someone who was so soft, she sure had a lot of sharp angles. Luke rolled sideways, depositing her in the sand next to him. He stood and offered her his hand. For a moment, she didn't move, glaring up at him through her veil of not red, not brown, not blonde hair. Then she huffed, and grabbed his hand. If the brush of her hair on his cheek had been soft, the brush of her skin against his was softer still. He was still, he was still processing these sensory details when she pulled away from him and began shaking sand from her clothes. Do you always walk around with your eyes closed? Luke followed suit, brushing off his jeans. Only when I know where I'm going. Her mouth dropped open, but no sound came out. She blinked at him. Like her hair, the color of her eyes was mercurial, hard to pin down. Green, brown, intelligent, wary. More pebbles skittered across his thoughts. Who was she? He'd never seen her on this beach before. Was she a guest at the resort? His brain whirred, and he instinctively reached for his notebook. But it wasn't there. His back pocket was empty. He'd been holding it when he was walking, holding it when they collided. Luke turned, searching the path. A moment later, he spotted the gleam of the metal spiral in a flash of sunlight. And a moment after that, a seagull swooped down and snatched it up. Hey, Luke yelled, shaking his fist and running after the bird. 
loops of the spiral clipped between its beak, the bird flapped its wings, propelling away from him. Give that back, you feathered felon! Um, I don't think the bird can speak English, the woman said from behind him, voice dry. And, if he was not mistaken, amused at him, because he was acting like an imbecile. Luke glared up at the bird, shaking his fist one more time. You better watch out. You better watch out, the woman warned, or that seagull is going to poop on you. Something wet and slimy splattered down the front of Luke's shirt. Now there was no mistaking it. She was definitely laughing at him. He scowled and dipped his chin, assessing the damage. A zigzag of bird crap decorated his chest. Awesome. And oh God, the smell. What the heck had that bird been eating for its excrement to smell so bad? The woman wrinkled her nose. It's not me, Luke began. Well, it, it is me, but it's not. It, it's the bird. She took a step back. Shit. He finished weakly and attempted to maneuver out of his shirt. He refused to wear what was basically now a seagull diaper. The problem was that Luke also wanted to avoid making contact with the wretched contents of the flying jerk's rectum, which meant he had to strategically be, uh, he had to be strategic about where he touched the shirt and how he pulled it off. Do you want some help? The woman offered. Do you want to help? He asked gripping the ends of his shirt between his fingertips and folding the worst of the damage over onto itself. Not really. Then why did you offer? Luke grunted, tugging the fabric over his head, gingerly stretching the collar so it didn't touch his face. Obligation, she said. Instinct, maybe. Your instinct is to offer help you don't intend to give? She crossed her, she raised her chin and met his gaze. I didn't say I wouldn't help, just that I didn't want to help. Luke bit his cheek. He could see why this sort of word game annoyed his sister. A gust of wind blew in from the lake, and the woman's mouth quirked, her attention shifting to his chest. That's a stiff breeze there, huh? Heat flushed his skin, and Luke fought the urge to cover himself. Stop looking at my nipples! Tall, lanky, and more than a little on the, pa on the pale side, he'd never been one of those walk-around shirtless kind of dudes. He was a programmer, for Christ's sake. Wow, you're grumpy, she observed. Well, you would be, too, if some woman ran into you, an asshole bird stole your notebook, and then the same woman who knocked you over is now standing there ogling your chest. I'm not ogling. Luke crossed his arms over his chest, forcing her gaze up to his. Okay, fine, maybe I was ogling a little, she admitted. But it's not my fault. You're a giant, and that, like, it's all right there in my face. How tall are you? She asked. Six four. He cocked his head. How short are you? Five four. Luke narrowed his eyes. She blew out a breath and rolled hers. Okay, fine, you got me. I'm five three and three quarters. He narrowed his gaze some more. Five three and a half. Almost. He grinned. Whoever she was, he liked her. All five foot three and almost a half inches of her. I could keep going, but we can stop there. <laughs> Super cute. Can I just say, though, that you need to narrate. Do you narrate your own books? Because you I should. do narrate audiobooks under a pseudonym. <laughs> Are you muted or am I? But I don't, I did not narrate this one. I told, um, so I did narrate my first series, Sometimes in Love. I narrated all three for Macmillan. Um, but with the new book, I told them that I didn't want to. I wanted dual narration. So they have, because the book is divided by the male and female POV by chapter. So uh -huh. it flips between the male and female POV. And I'm actually very glad that I made that decision because with the pandemic, trying to narrate in my own house with my entire family home <laughs> would, have been, <laughs> would have been a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> but I hope to get back into it. I've had to, because um, I do a lot of freelance narrating, and I've had to um, pass on every offer that's come in, and it's been so painful.
but I just, yeah. I just can't. There's just not, it's just not possible right now. So. Well, you do great. You well, read you. really beautifully. <laughs> it's, it's more of a traumatic reading. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Max it out. I know. I, I don't like watching myself read because I make the most ridiculous faces. <laughs> I, I don't so, like watching myself do anything. So yeah. well, I know a lot of people don't like hearing themselves talk. That doesn't mm -hmm. bother me. And I was also a speech team coach for many years. So working with people on their voice, getting comfortable with hearing themselves, that part, that's part's fine. But like watching it, it's a different story. <laughs> so now is everything okay? Speaking of faces, you look like something yeah. wrong. <laughs> Can you hear us? I think, I don't know if, she, can you hear us, Sonali? No, I don't think she can. I'm going to pull her out and back in again. Okay. Okay. And we'll see if that works. You hear us Hello? now? Yeah, she said she can't hear it in this okay. private chat. Hmm. So All right. So we'll message, message with her if you want to... Um, Sometimes some I can read a tiny bit more while we're working on her. <laughs> got some questions. So, so, so StreamYard does this to me sometimes, Dylan. She's going to have to actually go all the way back out and back in in order to get it to work. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> I got it. We got it. <laughs> She'll come back. Do you have any questions you want to see? I know there were a couple of questions. Yeah, we do have some. Um, so let's start with this one. What do you know that you wish you'd known at the beginning of your writing or publishing journey? What do I wish I had known? Um, uh, I think how much, I mean, I, I was aware of it viscerally, like how much work there is besides the actual writing. Like I was aware of it, um, but it has, it eats up so much more of my time then, and maybe that's on me, um, but but all the other pieces of being an author that there is beyond the writing, all of the, the social media and the engaging with your readers, which I love to do, but it takes the time away. And like in release month, doing events like this, again, lots of fun, but takes fun. time away from the writing and just coming up with stuff like graphics and um, things you can post and, and, and some of the stuff you can start to hire out and like writing newsletters and working on building your new, like all of those other pieces that require you to wear more hats than just the writing. Um, and again, like, you know, these, it's like having a kid, like, you know, viscerally, it's going to be a lot of work, but you don't realize just yes. how much work and how exhausting it's going to be until you're in the thick of it. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah. Yep. So only, did I say that right? I didn't say that right. <laughs> <laughs> it's the two drinks and the double fisting. <laughs> No, I'm so sorry. I kind of stopped. The last thing I heard was Melanie saying, I can go on and then everything just bleeds It's out. StreamYard. That's our that's our big glitch with them. Can you see the question on the screen? Because that, the that's part. what you can answer, then we'll be good. <laughs> you know, it's... Um, <laughs> I, I think it's the fact that the writing itself doesn't get easier. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, if you have this idea that you're going to have a few books out and magically the stories are going to come easier, um, they don't. Um, yeah. what, what does get easier, I think, is the fact that your belief that you can do it when you hit a wall, that you can get to the other side, that gets stronger. So you mm -hmm. know you can do it, but those moments when you're like, I have no idea how I'm going to do this, that doesn't go away. So I think that the writing itself um, doesn't get easier. Um, I think the pressure to tell better stories, um, you know, to push yourself, all of that just, so so it, it, you know, it just, the mountain piles up in different ways, which is exciting and wonderful. Um, but I don't know if it would have changed anything if I'd known uh, before. But yeah, magically, this is not going to become easier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and the more you write, and, and the more you get exposed to, you know, different craft techniques and things like that, it's like, it's almost like you, you know, I keep waiting until I feel like, gosh, I, I really feel like I have a handle on things. It's like, as soon as I feel like I've kind of gotten one area kind of 
you know, comfortable with that, then, you know, people think about, oh, well, you know, now you can do this and you can do this. It's like, oh, it just never ends, which is, like you said, super exciting, but also yeah. intimidating. And yeah. it does never end. It gets yeah. more intimidating. The pressure gets more and more. Mm -hmm. So the more you sell, because there's this a weird thing at the business end, which is that your trajectory is always, so, so almost in some ways, if your debut sells, you know, mediocre or lukewarm, then, you know, your trajectory is upward and it's almost easier. <laughs> you know, the, the big debuts are sometimes where, you know, because if your trajectory cannot flatten is what they'll tell yeah. you. Yeah. You know, yeah. it has to continuously keep on going upward. So there's those things, which I don't even really think anyone who's starting out should worry about because it will be like <laughs> you and there's enough to stymie you anyway. <laughs> and so... Yes. I, I actually, I love that optimism because I never, this is going to sound crazy because I've been writing since like 2010, but I've never even thought about that, that it's always up. Like, mm -hmm. unless, unless you have that like one off hit and then, and, and Debbie Maycumber, you know, she told me that there's, there's three types of writers, the, the, nat, the, the storyteller. And they're the ones that continuously write. They may not be good at the grammar, but they write. And um, and they're always writing stories because they always have that story to tell. Then there's the um, the grammarist who is really good at writing, um, but they may not necessarily get their stuff out there because they're so concerned about their editing that they're never convinced that it's edited good enough. And when they do, they're still worried about it. And then there's that natural writer, but that natural writer usually has a one-off because it's so good and the, the story is so great, but they always have this like crippling fear that they're never going to meet um like meet that expectation from the readers again so anyways i just i really love that but i i never thought of like it's always a an uphill climb for trajectory from there that's really yeah. great it's funny that you say that because i was just thinking about this yesterday when i started out for me it was the fact that i loved words and i love yeah. language and that was my favorite part of it was to actually make something with the words and over time i've realized that it's it's the storytelling that keeps yeah. you in it, right? Once you figure out why you're here and what kind of story you want to tell, then it just makes everything, I think, that much easier, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm certainly a storyteller. I mean, my editor will tell you that for sure, that I'm not a grammarist, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's fixes for that. It's the storytelling yeah. that no one can fix for you. So if yeah, you right. have to choose one <laughs> I'd be a storyteller like I'd yeah. never yeah yeah then you'd rather be that so I would for sure yeah. all right I got one more I got another one here do you have a recent read that you would recommend besides incense and sensibility <laughs> <laughs> yes you can't just recommend each other's that's cheating <laughs> that's, that's already Honestly, given I, I i just finished hang the moon by alexandria belfour and i really enjoyed it and it's funny because there were a lot of interesting little tiny I mean, our books are nothing alike. There were some similarities that were super cute. Like the hero is also like this six foot four nerd. So that kind of, you know, and um, he um, he wanted to be Hugh Grant when he was 10. So he <laughs> loves rom-coms and he tries to woo the heroine by reenacting rom-com scenes. There's a lot of little similarities from that book to mine. So that was kind of fun. And it's super cute. And it's called Hang the Moon by Alexandria Belfleur. Yeah, I, I have had a slight bit of a hard time reading recently because I'm on for the first time in my life. This is the first time I'm doing, you know, working actively on more than one project. So I'm, you know, this book with it. So I'm releasing a book. I'm on deadline. I'm revising a book and a short story. So I'm all over the place. This has, you know, never happened to me before. I'm incredibly grateful for it. But my brain is, you know, I, I the last question, something really brilliant popped in my head and I knew it was going to pop right out and it did. And I was like, 
it was brilliant, but nobody's ever going to know. So I'm, a lot of that has been happening to me because in there is a lot of white noise and, um, you know, and I don't know what we were talking about hormones and entering menopause or whatever is going on. <laughs> the reading is not, um, I did the last two books that I finished were um, Pack Up the Moon by, um, I was going to say Jane Austen, and that tells you, by Kristen Hagen, <laughs> who to me is as impactful as Jane Austen was, and, um, and Lizzie and Dante, which is Mary Bly, who is also Eloisa James. And they're both books with protagonists who are dying, and uh, they're beautiful, and they're life changing, and they're important books, but they did a number on my heart. <laughs> and, um, you know, and I think everybody should read them, but you need to. Need to go you need to be that. in the right headspace. Like, I can admit, I'm not in that headspace right you now. To have that to go, yeah, you have to guard your loins a little bit. Like, it's yeah. a little, you know, when you're, you do your Pilates, get your core to be your <laughs> <laughs> but, but they're books that I think everybody should read because they will change you and change how you think about life. And it's the kind of change I think will hold, you know, will, will do good for all of us. But those were the last books I finished. I've been starting an incredible number of books. So I'm in this place where the where the beginnings of books um, are, you know, really exciting me. And then when I go back to it, I've been having a hard time. So I um, started uh, The Bennett Women, which is also a Pride and Prejudice retelling by this author called Eden Apaya Kubi. And it's um, it's just incredible. It's, um, it's, it's a modern take and it's set in this um, all, all women's uh, dorm in a college. So it's a younger retelling. I really, really loved uh, the beginning of that. And I just started... Um, Tia Williams, Seven Days in June, and that might be one of the best prologues I have ever read in my yeah. life, ever. <laughs> so, so maybe one of those books will push me into chapter two. They both are really calling to me, but I'm, um, yeah, I, I, yes. <laughs> <laughs> kind of I, I, I listen to audiobooks. All of my like pleasure reading is all audio. Yeah, I'm. I have. I. I think time wise, that the only time. I used to be a huge audiobook reader back in the day of uh, the series when you couldn't go times one, times two. Um, <laughs> I listened to Outlander that way. Do you know how many CDs that was? Yeah. So I went, you are on CD 22, and CD 23 is damaged, you know, and so that was, that was back then. I, but I traveled, like, I drove, I had a long commute, and it made, you know, my commute so uh, mm -hmm. bearable. But I haven't, um, yeah, I haven't. I need to get back into audiobooks. I need need to get back into reading, but first I need to finish this book. But <laughs> yeah. well, should we pause on questions, Dawn, so we can hear yes. from Sonny, and then we can fit in as many as we can at the end. Yep. That's oh, right. I know. Yeah, there's some good ones in there. <laughs> yeah. uh, we want to make sure we have time for Sonali to read. So. So what are you reading for us tonight? Do you need to set it up or you start from page one? Um, yeah, I'll set it up. It is, um, I'm reading from this book that just came out. It's called Incense and Sensibility. <laughs> um, and so this is, um, as I said, she, he's going to go, you know, he's in this place where um, where he's, um, he needs help and um, and so this is the scene where uh, it's the first time they're meeting after the 10 years. So he, his cousin, who is her friend, has taken him to, um, to her yoga studio. And, um, and of course, she's not expecting him because she had, you know, because she, her, her cell phone was off. And, and so it's a bit of a surprise. So here we go. All right. We'll see you after. Thank you. All right. India took the stairs down and made her way through the studio to the front door. She pressed her face to the mullioned glass to see who it was and threw the door wide open. The bells on the doorknob went off in a jingling frenzy. Ashna, I'm so glad to see you. She wrapped her arms around Ashna. Ashna's his cousin. How's your cousin? I was so worried. Is everything okay? Did you need a session? How is the bodyguard? Is he... Ashna quickly returned her hug, then pulled away and looked over India's shoulder at someone standing off to the side. India spun around. Oh, she had forgotten how tall he was. 
how long-limbed and athletic, how thick his hair, how stark the gray of his eyes against his dark skin, how wide his shoulders. She'd forgotten the sheer force of his presence. Like an absolute and utter idiot, she made a sound that belonged to no language on earth. His lips did the barest twist. She had no idea if it was a smile or a grimace. Raising his hand, he gave her a wave. A wave? As though he were on stage and she were one of his political groupies lapping up his speeches and waiting to shake his hand. Now that he was standing here, all healthy and vibrant as ever, she wanted to shove him away and slam the door in his face. She'd been waiting a long time to slam the door in his face. I texted you and tried to call, but you didn't answer, Ashna said, and India spun to her, praying that the embarrassment burning her face wasn't visible. She had turned her phone silent at the doctor's office and forgotten to turn it back on. Do you have a moment to talk? Ashna asked. They wanted to come in? Both of them? Why? Absolutely. Come on in. Before India could step aside and let them in, a woman in a black muscle shirt and an earpiece stepped out from behind Yash. Is there anyone in the studio? She had red spiked hair and the palest blue eyes. The word assassin came to mind. This is Brandy, Yash's bodyguard. Ashna said, sliding a quick look at Yash, his new bodyguard. The lines around Yash's mouth tightened. He looked away when India caught the punch of pain in his eyes. Now that he was past, now that she was past the initial shock, he seemed drawn. His angular face had filled out. All of him had broadened and gained gravitas. The streaks of silver radiating from his temples took the gravitas to the next level. Despite that, there was a hollowness to him, not even a hint of the energetic sparkle she remembered in his eyes. Don't think about his aura. His golden aura had been a magnet to her, the only aura that, had, that she had ever read wrong. Now it had dulled to a tarnished bronze. He'd been shot, and the rate at which he'd been campaigning was nothing short of frenzied, so maybe she shouldn't be surprised. Gauging people was her job. Intuitively knowing what ailed them was her greatest skill. But there was something in his face that she couldn't put into words. The bodyguard extended her hand and India took it. It's nice to meet you. She hated how much she loved that his bodyguard was a woman. Likewise, Brandy said. To no one's surprise, she had an impressively assertive handshake. Is there anyone else in here? The studio is closed. India threw a look at the closed sign hanging over the door. Yash was watching her. The awareness of it fell like sparks on her skin. She was glad for the tie-dye yoga jacket she'd thrown over her usual yoga wear. No one needed to see the goosebumps that danced down her arms. He hadn't said a word, but his presence was a hum in the air, exactly like the breathing of a sleeping dragon in a fairy tale. Are there any other entrances to this place? Brandy asked. There's an entrance in the back that leads up to our home on the upper floors. Yash looked up at the facade of the studio and the late afternoon sun caught his eyes. A crystalline gunmetal gray she'd never seen anywhere else. She had, to, she had been to the house he'd grown up in. Just the pool house on the Raja estate was larger than the Dashwood studio and apartments put together but it was hers and she loved it. Childish as it was, she stuck out her chin as he looked at her, but he gave nothing away. I'm going to go around the back and check it out. Please keep this door locked, Brandy said. It's a pretty safe neighborhood, India wanted to say, but Yash had just been shot, so India was happy for Captain Marvel here and her paranoia. Come on in, please. She pushed the door open and Ashna walked in. Yash pressed a hand against the door and held it, waiting for India to go in before following her. He still hadn't said a word. She led them through the waiting area past the registration desk. Yash took in the place with that utterly flat expression he'd been wearing the entire time. 
the kind of expression a guilty person might paste across his face when invited to testify in front of a grand jury. Trying to get people to plumb the depths of their emotions was what India did for a living. Resistance was her daily companion. He was not here of his own free will. And this was not in the least bit surprising. Let's go to my office. Her office was her sanctuary. Self-consciousness still kicked in her gut when she thought about the dramatic beauty of his par parents' estate. She kicked it right back and let them pass the yoga rooms and showers and threw her office door open. Fading sunlight streamed in through the wall of windows lined with shelves that held her grandmother's bonsais. They were now her bonsais. Ashna sat down on the couch, but Yash walked straight to her bonsais, mouth slightly agape. A universal reaction to the miniaturized trees her grandmother had tended for 50 years and India would cherish for as long as she lived. She would not let the fact that he looked awestruck by her cherished trees affect her. It was perfectly normal to be fascinated by an art form that harnessed the splendor of a giant life form. Is this a banyan tree? Those were the first words he uttered, the first words he'd addressed to her in 10 years. Not that it was anticlimactic or anything. I too can go on, but. <laughs> I love it. Oh, that was amazing. Awesome. <laughs> I don't know how long that was, but. Melanie's oh. muted. Can you, you show us the, um, can you show us the cover to that book again? Incense and sensibility. Yes, um, and, and they didn't get to the part with Chutney the dog, which is hilarious. <laughs> it smells <laughs> <so> awful. <laughs> but the, it really shows Yash's other side because he lets the, this horrific smelling dog like lick his face. <laughs> oh, funny. Yeah, because because the thing they say about Chutney, uh, her dog, is uh, that she was na named Chutney because she smelled like a mix of many things, none of them good. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. All right, yeah. we have some question. We have a couple questions. Um, let's do this one. It was Karen. She stopped at a gas station <laughs> and gave us a question. What is your favorite time of the day? <laughs> I, mine is, um, has anyone read uh, Kate Claiborne's Love at First, which just came out earlier? It talks about well. that golden it's hour. Yeah. about the golden hour. So I think for me, it's that for, so, so I wrote, there's another question about having kids and writing around them. So I wrote when my children were young and were in school. Now they're grown adults and off in college. Um, but that morning, before anybody in the household woke up. So I would come down at five and, you know, get my cup of chai and have two hours at least of silence. It was my favorite time. And uh, this is a terrible thing to say, and I love my family dearly, but when I would hear the stirring start, I was like, ah, go back to sleep. <laughs> I really feel that right now in the middle of all of this. Yes. Um, so the early morning hours are, you know, and, and if there's bird song, uh, you know, and uh, and it's a beautiful day and you can be sitting in the sunroom. Yeah, that's the best. I'm a night owl. So I would say, you know, you have kind of like those hours after the kids go to bed. Um, they talk about, I'm trying to think of the, there was a phrase for this. It's like revenge. Um, there's a word for it, like for, for especially parents who are like trying to reclaim free time after the kids go to bed and you're just off and you're just like, you just don't want to go to bed because you want to like just chill, you know, just kind of just, yeah. just chill. So I, I do, I do like, as far as like writing is concerned, like I, um, I do like those kind of, um, burning the midnight oil kind of hour. So for me, it's when it's like two o'clock in the morning and everyone's asleep and I'm just kind of yeah. like in my own little zone. <laughs> Although it's getting harder to do the older I get. My bring in that white noise. Like I don't even, I'm, I'm going to go back and watch this and I have no idea what I'm saying, honestly. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> have you been, have you been burning the midnight oil too? Have you been up a lot? <laughs> no, I, there is no midnight oil. There's no oil to so burn. For me. So I like them, the, that early morning writing time, but like my husband is a cuddler. So if I, if <laughs> I'm in bed, like he will not like, let, like he like, yeah. oh my gosh. <laughs> so I had to like pry myself out. 
Isn't that funny? Isn't that funny? Like my husband isn't a talker, but sometimes like in the morning when I need to get up and get to work, if he wakes up early, he wants to chat about everything. <laughs> Like, yeah. Yeah. Go back to being quiet. <laughs> I, I feel you both. I feel you both. My, I, I get up at 4.30 to write. And or sometimes, like lately, it's literally just to have my coffee before <laughs> everybody else wakes up. I also stay up later watching my shows. I call them my shows and my sanity time. Um, but my husband is also a cuddler. And I get to the... I, I, turn into a ninja at in the morning when I'm trying to get out of bed. And he's like, literally like 200 and, 211 pounds, like holding me down. And I'm just like fighting him off yeah, just so I can get out of bed to have my coffee. Yeah, I get it. So I, mean, I, I remember having some friends when I was younger who just don't like to be touched when they sleep. These are guy friends. And I was like, oh my gosh, if I meet someone like that, I know that that's a, that's a deal breaker. Like that's a deal breaker. <laughs> oh, Catherine, I'm so sorry. Kevin, talking about a one month old and two, yeah, you're in that yeah. phase, phase where sleep, what is that? Like I saw yeah. a new, like college student, working all the time, up studying all the time. There's nothing like the newborn sleep. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No, I I saw Catherine here today and I was like, oh man, she's Staying in their listen through. To, you she's know what? I, I actually listened to a lot of audiobooks while I'm nursing my second. Mm -hmm. And I wish I had done the same thing with the first because that actually made me almost look forward to having to get up in the middle oh, of the night. I did I, I did I edits. I watched Nick at Night rerun. It was not worth being up. I mean, that was no, like the only no. thing. <laughs> oh. You know, I I nursed I nursed in my sleep, and I my boobs are here to tell the tale. Yeah. Not a good thing to do for your breasts, but a good thing to do for your sleep. So you you know you pick your <laughs> again again. <laughs> I've done all of that. I've got four kids. I've watched Nick at mm -hmm. Night. I've mm -hmm. also nursed in my sleep. And mm -hmm. um, what was yours, Melanie? I listened to audiobooks while yeah. I yeah. well I didn't listen to audiobooks. I'll, I'll give that. But I did edit books. I don't know how. <laughs> That's but pretty I did. talented. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I, was the my the on my head. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what is the first romance novel that you have ever read? Oh, I, I know this one. Mine was Joanna Lindsay and it um I always forget the title, but it was the one that has sex on a horse. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my gosh! Last one. Last one. Put on. Oh, with. Thank you for clarifying. Oh my this god! Is the show. It's one of those one of those like classic covers of hers, the clinch cover, where he's like buck naked and like up against her back. <laughs> okay, so if you remember the title, please give it to me. What is I'll look it up. I, I, I know really do. I just have to remember the specific combination of words. <laughs> <laughs> but I was babysitting, um, and the kids had gone to bed, and this book was sitting like on the top of the TV or something, and I picked it up and I was like, What is this? <laughs> <laughs> was that the first ever romance novel? It was the first romance novel I ever read. And I was like 10. Like this was back when like babysitting at 10 was okay, you know? <laughs> no, yeah, I babysat at I was the oldest of four kids, so I had already been babysitting my siblings yeah. and it was yeah. So that was, you know, and then I started going to the library and checking out more Joanna Lindsay's and getting very dirty looks. <laughs> So, so hold on a second. At ten, was this your first exposure to sex on a horse? Like, was on a horse? I mean, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I don't know. Like, if that was my first exposure to sex itself, it was my first romance novel, and definitely my first time experiencing coitus happening on a moving horse. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that a moving horse. That would set you up in a way for a life. Well, obviously, because here I am now writing romance novels. Holy crap, this is the best conversation we may have ever had on this show, can I just say? So, wow. I mean, my first sex scene ever was Other Side of Midnight, the Sydney Sheldon book. Also, you know, before I knew anything else, I'm like, did he, did she say mouth? Like, how is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have to keep this peach. 
Yes. <laughs> My my mom and dad, um, the bookshelf was full of Sydney Sheldon and Jackie Connor, and I don't even remember which one I read first, but and we also had Danielle Steele, but she was a little more, I mean, way, way more PG. Yeah, yeah. 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 Than the others. I, I I grew up reading much more of the Sydney Sheldon, um, you know, Jackie Collins, uh, younger. So I didn't have too much exposure um, when I was very young in my teen years to um, romance novels per se. But I do remember my first boyfriend. And this is the weirdest story. His aunt, so his mom's friend, was uh, you know was from the royal family of something. So she wrote this romance novel under a pseudonym. So this was an Indian woman who wrote this romance novel under a pseudonym. You know, under a white pseudonym. And we're talking eighties. Um, I think it was the eighties or the nineties, early nineties, and it was called Charlie Mar. I think it was. I had to go in search to find the name of this book, Ooh. and I think it was called Charlie Mar. And it was a big secret that she had written it, but he had a copy and he let me have it. And I found the story so enchanting, and you know, so like he was. He was one of those guys who always had these, you know really like interesting bookish things happening in his family and so you know this princess auntie friend had written this novel and nobody could know it was by her and so that was my first and I think that it was um it, it was this this prince uh it's almost like this beauty and the beast story and she is this british um you know a woman who is for some reason locked up in his palace and he's this dark so it was all the exotification and all the things that you know would make me cringe today i do need to read it again but the sweetest thing in it was that this guy had a scar and so through the whole thing, it's like the dangerous scar, right? And it turns out in the end that he has the scar because he slipped on a bar of soap. <laughs> so it was like all the things. And um, yeah, and then years later, I was like, what was that book? And no, and so then when I tried to find out, he was like, oh, there was no aunt. And oh, there was no auntie who wrote it. And then I was like, come on. I know. Like when you were going to deny it. <laughs> I did find it's Savage Thunder. And it's, this is the one. Yeah. So Savage Thunder. Okay. Savage, Savage Thunder. Thunder. Is that Fabio? Was that Fabio? No. I mean, he's, definitely got, I mean, he's got the dinner plate peck. So it's yeah. got the. Yeah, yeah. And so the moves. Teresa, Clan of the Cave Bear, I had to read that in my sophomore honors English class. And so I'm like with a bunch of 14, 15 year old boys having to read that book. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I read yeah. all of those from the same bookshelf that held the Jackie Collins. Yes, there was the trilogy or whatever. And actually, it's kind of funny because my oldest had one of those books. I'm like, where in the world did you find that? <laughs> and my, so we, he played the movie in class like <laughs> the clan of the cave bear oh. movie <laughs> um he was a very progressive kind of teacher mm -hmm. and oh, like we all try to be cool like yes yeah, like you know you know there's like if we you didn't watch that movie or read the book and, you know yeah. the scenes i'm talking about that ooh, i'd be uncomfortable at my age now watching in a room full of people let alone when i was like 14. <laughs> Crazy. Uh, I, I did Google Shalimar while Sonali was talking. Was it Rebecca Ryman? Well, I, you know, it's, and I have to, I think it's that book, but I have to go back and read it to be sure. But of course, her name is not actually Rebecca Ryman. Is if right, obviously. I remember yes. this right. But of course, someone, if someone kills me, you know why? Because this is a big secret. <laughs> yeah. You just revealed it on Romance Happy Hour. That's right. Mm -hmm. Of course, she didn't give us <laughs> the real author's name. So we'll keep that under lock and key. We'll I might, I might live. Yeah. We'll talk to that later. So Dawn, right, well, we, we are over per the usual. Are. Is there one last burning question that just needs to be answered? I'll go through yeah. later and any questions we didn't answer, I can go and reply to them. Because they were okay. some great there's some great questions tonight in there. So thank you. Yeah, there was some I, I didn't get to, but let's do this one. If you could have one of your books turned into a movie, which one would you choose and who would you like to star in it? <laughs> 
Um, well, I would love my debut, uh, Getting Hot with the Scott, to be turned into a movie. The opening of that book is so much fun. Um, the way that there is like they're in a Scottish castle and she really believes like she's accidentally fallen into an outlander moment and has found a, a time traveling Scott. <laughs> That's funny. Um, <laughs> but no, she's being she's being a prank. So that whole scene to see that and plus just to get like a hot guy in a kilt on, on camera. <laughs> so obviously, you know, one of the obvious choices would be um, the guy that plays Jamie Fraser. But um, I would think, um, you know, there's a model named Ken Beck, who is a very attractive ginger man who would make a great, uh, a great hot Scott. So, yeah, getting out of the Scott. I would love to see that on the big screen. Yeah, I, I think my style is generally very cinematic because I come from, you know, my, my fiction started with trying to write scripts for Bollywood films. So I think my style, I, I write very cinematic. So it's almost like all of them would be the answer. But of course, I'd love to see the Rajay series, um, you know, be um, be a series. And um, and yeah, we uh, I, I posted on my Instagram page uh, the picture of um, of a 1960s. So so, you know, a vintage picture of this Bollywood star who is almost exactly the way um, that I imagine Yash in my brain. But of course, he would have been. 80 now and he's dead. So <laughs> I'm going that up won't work. It. That is not super sexy. 80 yeah. 80 and dead is not super sexy. Yeah. He has very, very sexy sons. So, <laughs> so maybe that will work. But I think that um, Manish Dayal, uh, if anyone knows who he is, if you watched 100 Foot Journey, really, really intense. Um, so he could play any one of them. Um, the youngest brother, so the Emma, uh, so Bunch is a little bit more of the haughty, uh, buff, you know, um, cutie van. We can uh, drop a few pictures in the kind. <laughs> yeah, we can do uh, that. And, um, yes. Yeah, so it's going to be it. It with this, um, I always thought that my Pride and Prejudice, Pride and Prejudice, and other flavors couple, uh, in my head they look like um, Idris Elba and Indira Varma. So if anyone's ever watched uh, Luther, the 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 lead couple, um, and of course I think age wise maybe it doesn't fit, but uh, but Indira Varma is very much Trisha, and Idris Elba is kind of how dj was in my head crossed with trevor noah which is interesting but <laughs> <laughs> i'll take it <laughs> thank you for having us <laughs> yes yeah. hey, our pleasure. no we um lots of comments about how how much fun everyone has had and how much they've enjoyed it so thanks for being with us you yes both for sure giveaways posted up on on the romance happy hour facebook page and we'll leave those open until sunday night i know uh mel be of your latest and i think sonali you've got a copy of your latest up there too so did we I so pop yeah, i think right. you're giving away the first in the series sonali oh, yeah? sorry. yes yeah. it is the first in the series i'm sorry and i'm yeah and i'm giving away you can either get a print copy of this or the audiobook version if you prefer yeah yeah, yeah not, if you've no, already no. read the first in the series i'm happy to give away this one too okay. so, all good. got it so, so pop yeah. over there and and up and sign up for it for sure because this was hilarious and i loved tonight's show yeah well mm -hmm. thanks for having us this is great thank, it's you. Fun. And thank you everyone That's who joined the chat your questions were great yeah and um if you have time go back and there are several that we didn't get to so we apologize oh yeah i definitely will i got Come a little back. bit of my cocktail left to finish so i'll answer <laughs> questions <laughs> I'll probably do it tomorrow so you don't, so you, my answers actually make sense. So I, didn't, oh. <laughs> I got half of it. Yeah, Dawn's got uh, a half out of her two. Okay. So. I love it. I love it. It's hilarious. Very good. Well, I don't know. Why I'm gonna, my secret. Without you next month, Dawn, I don't know. It, it might just be our most sober romance happy hour ever. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Dylan, you tell me I can't ever keep a secret, but you know, I kept this secret for like almost a year. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you can, you can have, I mean, happy hour is whatever drink makes it's you happy. happy hour. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're not good at keeping other people secrets gone right right that's true <laughs> well no other people's i am dylan's i'm not 
Right. Right. Also, just but, you. It's just you. Other so people who are not me with. So. Yeah. Oh. All right. Well, I hope everyone has a great weekend. I hope you all stay cool, and we will catch up with you next time. Thanks for being here. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.